Welcome to season two of Witchlit, a space to talk about the craft of writing and writing the craft. I'm your host, Victoria Rashke, author, publisher, witch, and nosy Scorpio. Margaret Kiljoy is a trans feminine author, musician, and podcaster living in the Appalachian Mountains. She is the author of A Country of Ghosts, as well as the Danielle Kane series of novellas, and is the host of the Community and Individual Preparedness podcast, Live Like the World is Dying, and the history podcast, Cool People Who Did Cool Stuff. She can be found on Twitter at Magpie Kiljoy. Margaret Kiljoy, welcome to Witchlet. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you on the show. And we talked a little bit beforehand and I'm just excited you're here and we'll try desperately not to fangirl. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But our first question for everyone, because we're mostly a podcast about writing, is why write? Uh, I've kind of just like always wanted to is like the biggest part of it or like I've always sort of done it. Um, I got really lucky in that like, my dad, um, he doesn't publish his fiction, but he writes fiction. And I always grew up with like fiction around lots of books around. And then I kind of have been one of these people where if I like engage with something as a spectator, I also really, really want to do it myself. Um, and so I don't know, I grew up reading a lot of books and I was just kind of like, I'm going to, I'm going to write books at some point, you know? And then, um, I don't know. And then I would just, I would do it to sort of entertain myself or entertain my friends with little, I kind of came up in like a, a DIY, like zine publishing world. And so I would just write short stories and make them into little pamphlets and and give them away and stuff. Um, I guess it just kind of built up from there. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think I was, I was thinking about this question for you specifically mm-hmm. because you write fiction, you write nonfiction, mm-hmm. you also podcast mm-hmm. and you write music. So it's like, how do you decide when you're working on something, which bucket that goes in? Like, where does an idea go for you? Yeah. Well, this is a podcast where it'll be easier to give the actual answer to that than usual <laughs> because the actual answer is, is magic. Um, not that I magically decide, but rather that I like, I, I, I perceive the work that I do, my art through a sort of magical lens as in like, I'm trying to cast these like spells. I'm trying to, because I'm trying to have an impact on culture um and or or even just give people aesthetic experiences right like i i want this emotion to be expressed and so then i just think about what medium works best for that kind of for the spell i want to cast you know like um to to get into like cheesy like dungeons and dragons terms i tend to think of it as like like writing has a really long casting time uh, especially writing novels, really long casting time, you know, cause it takes years uh, to write the book, to get the book published for people to actually read the book for people who've read the book to internalize it and have discussions about it and process it and turn it to their own thing. You know, cause my goal isn't to like self replicate it. I want other people to have my ideas. I want people to have their own ideas, you know? And, and so writing is a really, really long casting time as compared to of of the work that I do, short essays or music tend to be the fastest, right? Those are the ones that like, Hey, I have an emotion and then I make a song about it. And then, you know, if I can trick people into listening to it, then they get to have that aesthetic experience or I get to transfer on that aesthetic experience much faster. And um, so, yeah, I just, I think about it from that point of view. I, I even, um, it's kind of awful. I'm getting back into writing longer fiction again, slowly, but I kind of stopped for a while a few years ago and moved back more towards short fiction and more towards music because I, and podcasting in particular because of that faster turnaround time, because I felt like we were in such a crisis mode that I was like, I don't have time to write a novel about the end of the world. It's the end of the world. You know, uh, I'm going to write a podcast about the end of the world instead. And, and lo and behold, it's never actually the end of the world and until it is. Um, and so now I'm back to like, all right, I could probably, I could probably get a novel out sometime soon. I like it. So you mentioned that you started out writing zines and short stories and that. Mm -hmm. So how did that morph from like writing zines and short stories to then like more traditional publishing? So I, I was writing zines and then 
I got into steampunk uh, in like 2004 before it kind of became what it became for, for better or worse, a little bit for worse from my point of view. And I don't even remember. It was like 2006, 2007 or something. I was like, Oh, I'm going to start a zine about steampunk. I'm going to call it steampunk magazine. And so I started a magazine called steampunk magazine. And I had no idea that steampunk was like about to blow up. And I don't really think I helped to blow up, but I was like in on the ground floor. And so that, meant that the stuff I was publishing got a lot more attention than it would have otherwise. Right. Uh, you know, it got picked up by, uh, Cory Doctorow's blog, Boing Boing. Well, it's a lot of people's blog or not even really a blog website, whatever. And, and it was my first experience of like a wide readership. And it, I was an editor more than I was a writer, although I would slip my fiction in under other names sometimes. And, Actually, the first issue I wrote probably most of because I didn't know anyone. So I just wrote it all under a bunch of different names um, because that's the way I used to do things when I was a you know 25 year old punk kid. And and I didn't really stick super long with steampunk. I mean, I did for a while, but I I, I like the DIYness of it. I like what it can offer about like anti colonial critiques and things. But the the culture that grew up around it wasn't quite my thing. And so I kind of stepped away from it. Also felt sort of aesthetically limiting to, to only focus on that. Um, although I would say that uh, my first published book is a choose your own adventure book called um, what lies beneath the clock tower. And that's like pretty steampunk. And I like that book still. I don't know why I'm being so defensive about steampunk. I think I have very complicated feelings about this. And so I did that, but that's still me publishing my own stuff. And then I, I started working on a, a nonfiction book. I didn't think it was going to be a book. I thought it was going to be a collection of uh, zines because I wanted to interview anarchist fiction writers. And I started off by writing Ursula Le Guin and I, I wrote Ursula Le Guin and I was like, Hey, I'm a young anarchist fiction writer. And I want to find out why write fiction. Like, what does this mean? You know? And she wrote me back and said, yeah, I'd love to be interviewed. And so I, I did an interview with her and it was, it was actually by email. I didn't meet her in person until uh, a bit later. Um, and, and then it was really easy to find other people who wanted to be in it because I had Ursula Le Guin in it and everyone like me, like Ursula Le Guin's like the main person I fangirl for or fangirled for, I guess, um, rest in peace. And so I went around and interviewed other fiction writers who identified as anarchists about what social change, radical social change and fiction have to do with each other. And a friend of mine worked at the cooperative, the cooperatively run worker owned anarchist book publisher, AK press, uh, my friend Kate. And she said, this should be a book. And I was like, Oh, I can't write a book. I'm a you know 26 year old punk kid or whatever, however old I was. And she was like, why, why not? Why can't it be a book? You can do anything you want, you know? And so I made it a book. They made it a book really. And that was my first book and it was about fiction. <laughs> um, and then even then I still kept self-publishing and shit. I actually made my own worker owned publishing collective called combustion books that published what lies beneath the clock tower and then published a country of ghosts. Uh, my first like linear fiction book because clock tower is non-linear and then after all of that, I started seeking mainstream publishing. Um, I think I like kind of had this a little bit of imposter syndrome and a little bit of like aggressively DIY, you know, uh, attitude. And then at some point I was like, whatever, I am good enough to try and like be a science fiction writer, be a, a, a speculative fiction writer, um, which feels a little bit like trying to say you're going to be an astronaut. You know, it just seems like this impossible thing where you're like, because so many people want to do it. Um, but then I realized it was kind of like being saying you want to be an astronaut when you're like already in the air force and like have been working at it your entire life or whatever. So this is not the short version of the story. So then I went to the Clarion rest writers workshop. Um, I didn't expect to get in uh, Clarion rest the, the Clarion Writer Workshops, there's two of them, Clarion and Clarion West, and they're incredibly competitive. They have a, a low acceptance rate. And, and I had applied once and actually been rejected. And then a couple of years later, I applied again. And it was like kind of hard financially for me to apply at that time. I was living in my van up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I sold my short, first short story 
a story called Invisible People. I sold it. It's about anxiety disorder and hackers and squatters. And I sold it to an anthology called Accessing the Future, which is like disability and science fiction. And I basically spent that paycheck on my application fee or a chunk of it on my application fee for Clarion West. It's like, okay, I'm going to take this gamble. And I was driving away from the Northwest. I was like in my van, stopped at a rest area, like sleeping on my bed in the back of it. And I get a call from Clarion West and they're like, you got in. And, and I said, I think I said, holy fuck. And I didn't ask you whether I can cuss on your show. I'm oh, sorry. We have um, You're good. Great. Um, and, and so I said, holy fuck. And then the, the, the person who called me thought I said like, something like mean, like, oh, fuck, or something, you know? And and she was like, what? And I was like, no, no, I'm just surprised. (laughs) Um, And so I I got in to Clarion West and I I, um, scraped and scrounged and and I called all my clients. Uh, I was a freelance designer and was like, please give me every job you can. You know, um, I'll do discount rate. Just give me all of the freelance work. I, my van broke down and I was like, whatever. And I like left my van and in, in my friend's front yard in Raleigh, North Carolina to like go take a combination of like Amtrak's and borrowed rides and stuff to get out to Seattle. I showed up in Seattle and I spent six weeks in the most like hog. It's funny. I always want to say it's like the most like Hogwarts or whatever type thing, but then I'm like, then Rawling kind of ruined that for all of us. But um, I got to go off to magic school. I got to go spend six weeks living in this giant house with uh, 17 other aspiring, like early professional career fiction writers while established writers came and taught us for six weeks. Um, And it was absolutely life-changing. It was life-changing. I already felt like I was writing at a good level, but the amount of information that I got in six weeks just really took my writing to the next level. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm a bit of a, like, I know people have a lot of issues with the the workshop model um, for fiction writing and it can be kind of elitist and it and isn't always accessible to everyone. I think that the Clarion, at least the Clarion West folks is the only people I have any communication with are trying to address those concerns as best as that they're able to, but it will never be perfect, but it meant a lot to me. And after that, I just started selling short fiction. And I also started um, ghostwriting trashy heterosexual romance novels um, because it was better pay than what I had been doing pre- previously. Um, and I did that until, no, I, never, I guess I'll just finish my saga of it, um, <laughs> until I, my first professional sale of a book was to Tor.com, which is legally distinct from Tor, but is the same thing as Tor by most practical understandings of the word. Um, and they bought a novella that I wrote um, called The Lamb Will Slaughter the Lion. And kind of at that point, it was just sort of like, I wasn't like done. That's just like the start, right? But at that point, it was like, okay, I, I leveraged that to get a literary agent. Um, and I've published a few books since then. And then, you know, I have a short story anthology coming out later this year. And that's how I got started writing. Yeah. No, that's a good story. And so A Country of Ghosts, you published first and then AK Press republished it, correct? Yes. Uh, So Combustion Books published it in 2014. And then AK Press did a reissue in 2021 because, um, well, it it, it was kind of ready for a new audience. Um, It's kind of interesting to me. In my head as a kid, I was like, well, the book's out. So if people want the book, they'll go get the book, you know? Um, but like the actual act of releasing books, uh, well, to tie everything back into magic, it's like, it's this, Hey, look at this energy that you're trying to draw towards stories. And, um, and I don't hate the the cover I did for the first edition, but you know, the second edition has a, a fantasy city painted on it. And Mm -hmm. I've always wanted a book with a fantasy city painted on it. I'm probably going to write a book with a dragon in it literally just to try and get a book with a dragon on the cover at some point in my life. Um, and, and then also, uh, the book had gotten a fair amount of attention and was kind of ready for it. People actually made a, there's no way to say this without sounding really weird and bragging. Uh, someone, some people made a a feature length film of it, um, in Montreal and it's a a bilingual film called Huron, which is the name of the city and a country of ghosts. 
or the name of the country rather in a country of ghosts, Hernopol is the kind the city. Um, and they made a, a sort of queer uh, speculative fiction film um, that kind of is only at the like it's you know like I've seen at like festival or like a festival or something right it's not a like wide release film um, but it was really amazing that was like kind of the first time I realized that you can like pass stories off and let other people ha- have their way with them you know mm-hmm. and turn them into their own spells um, that was really cool. cool. Like I would like to see the film because I enjoyed enjoyed the book. I um like just having read about it, like I kind of thought mm-hmm. I knew what I was getting into. And I was so emotional mm-hmm. by the end. Like I just did not uh-huh. expect to have that like emotional punch at the end. Yeah. And I, I was it's it's been I finished it a couple of weeks ago and I'm like, okay, I have to go back and reread it because it was just um like it's one of those books that I've tried to explain it to a couple of people. It's like, you start reading it thinking like you're in one place and you're like, Oh, this is mm-hmm. utopian fiction about what the world could be like. And and then by the time you get in it, it's like, Oh no, this is real. <laughs> like it's just, it's a real place you can go to like in your brain <laughs> kind of thing. So it's like, you know, yes, the, the idea of it, but also like the execution of it are kind of different things. So, yeah, totally. Um, but I oh, love that, the idea that, that somebody made a film. Oh, good. Yeah. No, I, it was just, yeah. I, I walked around like in a daze the whole day after I finished it, <laughs> trying to think about it. And I was like, that's the reaction you want people to have to your work. So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And I don't know. It, that one was, you know, it was interesting. I don't think I expected it to go so emotional when I first started writing it, you know? And then, but when you're writing about conflict like that, it just felt like the honest direction for it was just mm-hmm. to to take it in that emotional direction. Yeah. And I think for folks who haven't read it, like there is basically a war at the center of this book, even though it is this side, you know, kind of utopian fiction. Um, but yeah, just the the realness of those relationships between the people in the book and what fighting in a war does to you, whether you choose it or not, is it's it's all very well it's just well executed and you feel those emotions as characters are going through in the deepest way. Like you feel like your own friends have died. (laughs) So. (laughs) Yeah. Which is, you know, I don't know if that means to recommend the book or not, but yeah, it's, it's a, it it was something that I really consciously, um, I'm going to, I'm going to pretend like that was question mark at the end and, and yes. explain that. Is that yes. okay? That's I feel great. really haughty talking about no, my no, no, work, no, no. I guess please, that's the point do. of being on the podcast. Yeah, no, that's the point. Um, so you know, I was thinking, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to write a war book, right? It, it, a country of ghosts is a utopian book in that there's like a, an anarchist country with indistinct boundaries because they're anarchists and they don't really want a nation state, but they, and they're, and they're being invaded by a colonial force. And then they have to kind of get over a lot of their differences. They do, they're, they are organized. Like anarchism is not lack of organization, but, but, you know, they got to get their shit together and defend themselves um, and deal with a lot of like interpersonal conflict and some like social level conflicts in order to do so. And I was like, okay, but this is a, this is a book about war. And I th- it's a book about war where I think people are very justified in going and, and solving problems with violence, but I absolutely don't want to make a like, glorious book, right. About like, hurrah off to kill. We go, you know? Um, and yet I also don't want to make something that's just like doom laden, like suffering the, because I think that struggle alongside your, you know, compatriots or comrades or whatever words you want to use is beautiful. Um, I haven't engaged with it at a military level. I've engaged with it at a you know protest level, and you know, but it it there's a beauty to it, and there is an appeal to to it. Um, and I think that the right wing is very good at evoking at, at calling upon you know the the beauty of struggle or whatever. I think they do it through lies. I think they do it through this you know glorious whitewash, like everything's perfect, and you just sort of ignore all the death and suffering. You know. Um, and so I wanted to do it in this honest way. I wanted to do it in this, like, here's why fighting is beautiful. And here's why fighting is tragic. And here's why fighting is necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as much as I was able to, you know, and, uh, and so that was, 
yeah, at least as much as it's an exploration of an anarchist society, it's actually, I feel like it was my attempt to, um, uh, come to terms with like conflict and struggle and, and war and all that. Yeah. I mean, I think the fact that there are characters that choose to fight for what they want and what they believe in and defend this society that they created for themselves. And there are also characters who choose not to fight because that's not who they are. And yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is a really different exploration of those ideas. And so but it's also uh, the thing that was interesting is reading it back to back with the Daniel Kane books is mm-hmm. it's so different because I've read the <laughs> Daniel Kane series first, which really is more, I mean, they're both speculative fiction in their way, but I would say like mm-hmm. in some ways, the Daniel Kane book is more fantasy oriented because it does have mm-hmm. what I refer to. We've talked to you about it on the podcast. It's like special effects magic. You know, it's like you have <laughs> this idea as practitioners or witches or whatever of what, you know, real magic looks like and then what Mm -hmm. fantasy magic looks like. So this one has more of that element to it. So Mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about how magic works in those books in the Daniel Kane books? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, A Country of Ghosts is, um, it's only speculative fiction in that it's a secondary world fiction. Just not even, I didn't know that word when I started writing it, but it's, it's, it's not set on earth, right? It's set on another like earth-like. And in this case, it's set in like kind of a, and turn of the 20th century, like late 1800, late nine, eight, late 1800s kind of level of technology and stuff. The Danielle Kane books, uh, for anyone who hasn't read them, is our books that follow um, a hitchhiking woman named Danielle Kane, who's kind of in her late twenties, I think, and getting tired of being a traveler and wants to kind of find a place to settle down and is also off trying to solve the mystery of what happened to uh, her best friend who killed himself. And so she ends up in this squatted town. And so in some ways it presents a similar sort of utopian setup, but in this case, the squatted town, which is not actually like uh, to a lot of people it reads as like post-apocalyptic. I kind of meant it as like now ish, like now plus five years or something. And there's a squatted town in Iowa that they've renamed freedom, Iowa, and their city is, their town is being protected by a demon. They summoned um, named Ulixie who I've tattooed on my arm because I'm weird. And all the characters in the book have Ulixie tattooed on them, even though he's kind of a bad guy. Well, he's actually, he's completely neutral, but people using him is bad, which is the whole point, whatever. That's the moral of the story anyway. Um, And our protagonist does not know that magic is like quote unquote real until they show up and they're like, Oh no, there's literally a three antler blood red deer that's running around eating people. Um, and that's like the moment of like magic is real in that book. And you know, it's funny cause it's like, there's, it is more, it's like more magic than I believe in. Right. I don't believe in special effects magic to any appreciable degree. Although I would argue that like shit we do with science isn't the furthest thing. I mean, I don't know. I actually don't want to argue that because I think magic is less about like the effect you create and more about the process you use to get there. Um, so, well, I don't know. Um, but it, it's funny because that book ends up classified as a horror book, um, not urban fantasy, right? I mean, it's actually not particularly urban, so that makes sense. But I didn't. I also didn't write it to be like I'm going to write horror, which I do sometimes, but not all that often because I'm a scaredy cat. And uh, I think it's it's horror because I think if you introduce special effects magic into the real world, you get horror. <laughs> I I struggle to come up with a way in which like someone being able to summon demons or cast fireballs or uh, take over people's minds or whatever. I, I struggled to come up with a version of that that isn't horror. Yeah, I mean, that kind of magic is kind of horrific. And I don't usually read horror, but I did not find it like I wasn't couch, you know, crouched under the covers mm-hmm. reading it. It's not that kind of horror. It's not like yeah. jump scare horror. It's the, yeah. I think you can have horrific ideas <laughs> and there, mm-hmm. and those are horrific ideas without it being what I would consider a traditional horror, maybe. Yeah. So, I yeah. See why I, it's I, not classed as urban fantasy, although I argue mm-hmm. that urban fantasy just has to happen in a populated area. <laughs> so. That makes sense to me too. I, I, you know, I, as a reader, I love genres and as a writer, I hate genres. <laughs> so. Yes. I think that is a, a valid opinion. <laughs> 
so what was the seed? What was the seed for the Daniel Kane books? Like what kind of mm-hmm. spurred that? So it's funny, is it actually, um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Uh, when I finished A Country of Ghosts, I just kind of kept writing. Like it's sort of an afterbirth was like, <laughs> but but not the actual uh, Lamb will slaughter the lion, but instead this book called Freedom Iowa that no one will ever read um, that doesn't have any demons in it or any magic. And it's just set in the town of Freedom, Iowa. <laughs> um, and it's like a like social drama about like interpersonal conflict within this town. <laughs> um, and so basically I finished A Country of Ghosts. I finished writing A Country of Ghosts. And then I just like was so much in the habit of writing because I go through cycles. I don't, I'm, I'm not a write every day writer. I may write every day for three months, every two years writer or a write every day for a week once a month, I cycle in and out, you know? And so I wrote this book, I think it was called Freedom Maya. I don't, I don't remember what it was called. It wasn't very good. I, like like one or two people read it that I sent it to and they were like, oh, okay, cool. You know, and I should have been able to like pick up on that. And so I just put it down. And then um, my friend, uh, Diana Foe was, um, uh, who's an editor at Tor was like, Hey, I want a novella from you. I would love to consider a novella from you. And I was like, oh, okay. I got this one, but eh, it's no good. And it doesn't have any speculative elements. And so I just like sat down and I was like, well, what's wrong with this book? And I had since gone to Clarion West, right? And I had since kind of learned a lot about uh, diagnostic tools with which to figure out and fix problems in story and plot. And so I uh, I sat down and I was like, well, it needs, pardon, it needs stronger conflict, and it uh, probably needs a blood red three antler demon deer that becomes the manifestation of power that everyone can struggle with. And then I had to completely rewrite it. Right? There's no, there's not a single sentence in the the finished book that was in the original book. Some of the characters are still there, and some of the characters aren't. Um, to actually for like the, the funniest part of it from my point of view is that the protagonist in the original was actually a cis boy. And then Danielle is, um, I don't actually specify whether Danielle Kane is cis or trans, but she's, she's trans, but I didn't even realize that when I was writing it. Um, but I literally took my self-insert character, Jimmy and turned my self-insert character, Jimmy into my self-insert character, Danielle <laughs> around the time that time that I transitioned. Um, so I don't know, I, I completely overhauled the story. This is a long version of the story. Again, I, I live alone. So I'm always excited to talk to a microphone during the pandemic. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's how that story came to be. So we touched on this a little bit because you talked about using magic as kind of your spell casting for Rouge, but do you consider yourself a practitioner and how does that play does that play in other ways in your work besides how you spell cast oh it's so messy i guess i would say yes but it but in this way we're like i i have nothing but positive feelings about my friends who are, are practitioners in a more um, structured way or in a way that draws upon traditions to a greater degree but that's never super resonated with me. I think I I've always seen my life. A lot of my life is this like like long, slow crawl towards learning about the divine uh, or magic or the void or whatever it is, different names in my head at different times. And sometimes that looks a little bit more conscious in terms of practice. Um, Mostly I would say, I guess I work with my dreams. Um, I I'm kind of capable of, uh, setting myself up to dream about certain things to try and uh, figure out certain problems in my life. Um, And, but I have found that through writing, I'm able to also kind of tap into stuff, Um, you know, and it's like, it's like, I have a skeptic in my brain and a believer in my brain and they don't really fight it out. They just coexist. Um, and I'm kind of fine with that. I'm, I'm actually 
I think cognitive dissonance is one of the like greatest treasures we have as humans. Um, it's what allows me to exist within a capitalist hellscape world without like hating myself as a hypocrite every waking moment, you know? And it's also what allows me to both essentially have this, like, I hate to use the word materialist, but this very like, well, oh, yeah, I believe in science and I believe in, you know, I, I believe in um, physics and all of that stuff. And I, I don't think that precludes magic. I, I think that science and magic are two different ways of trying to reach the same conclusions or maybe sometimes different conclusions, but they're just different ways of gathering and using knowledge. So that said, when I, I give myself nightmares with my writing sometimes, uh, and I've been chased by Elixir, the demon deer, uh, in my dreams. And I also have sleep paralysis. So my dreams can be like really intense because they're not technically dreams. I'm technically like awake and hallucinating. And I actually think it's when I'm sleep paralyzed that I kind of connect the most with, um, the divine or the profane, or I don't know. I've, unfortunately, your audience is going to be better versed in this than me. I am, I am a, I am, I am lost in my own practice and don't, don't have the vocabulary that is shared between practitioners. But I, I, I dreamt about Elixir and, you know, I was talking about it to one of my friends who does uh, practice and, and I was like, yeah, but I, I made up Elixir and, uh, and my friend's like, but you didn't like you, you, you tapped into something that exists um, and kind of by believing and by presenting that to the world, to some degree, you're open this door. Um, and so it's a power that I like, don't take as lightly mm -hmm. as I, as I may be used to. Um, and then I spent two years living alone in a cabin in the woods during the pandemic. I, I built a, like, I used to live in this black triangle, a frame witch house that I built in the forest. And then like, it was totally fine when I lived there before the pandemic and I interacted with humans and then I stopped interacting with humans and I just lived in this cabin. And then I was like talking to plants and animals and um, kind of just losing my mind. And I feel like I learned a lot. <laughs> it seems like, like that that's an interesting experience to have after you basically summoned your own demon. <sighs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, Ulixi never visited me at that house, but, um, oh, this is funny. This is going to be, I don't, I don't think these stories have been for public consumption before dear listener. Um, I instead summoned this witch, uh, that I call the witch of pine because like, I don't know, man, it's really funny to just tell these stories that I usually kind of like keep to myself or tell my friends. Uh, cause I'm not like in a community of, of witches, but I was driving home on, I just played some like Halloween cover band show and I was like, and it was kind of goofy. We played a goth Brooks cover show where, where we like were playing Garth Brooks songs, but as a goth band. And then as we're driving home, I'm like, I'm going to get home and I'm going to, I'm going to go to my harp in this like barn in the forest with no electricity uh, where I was living at the time as I hadn't finished building the cabin. And I was like, I'm going to go to my harp and I'm going to play a song uh, with the lyrics. Um, I, I call thee witch of hemlock. I call thee witch of pine. And I have no idea why I go home. I write that song. I, I do think more about it, but I, I don't like overthink it. Right. And then while I was living in the cabin, uh, I started having these dreams about a sort of ageless woman who would kind of wander the woods near my house. Um, and then eventually like kind of started talking to me and would talk to me about the way that I was choosing to interact with the land and like, whether or not I was doing it in like the best possible way and like offered suggestions uh, a little bit judgmentally. And I don't know, it was completely possible. It's all just some dream shit, but that doesn't, it doesn't matter to me whether it was just dreams, you know, it, um, I don't know that your brain knows the difference ideas. anyway. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and what is reality, but was we presented through our brains and that gets into all kinds of philosophical questions about idealism and blah, 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 that I'm only like halfway versed. And, but <laughs> yeah, I would say I know just enough to be dangerous on that topic. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so when you, when you do write, when you have your writing spells, mm -hmm. like, do you feel like there's a ritual around that? Or are you just like this now it's time to write and I'm going to sit down and write? I guess, are you precious about that time when you were? Yeah, writing? yeah. I was going to say, I, 
I try not to be precious about it. Um, I try to treat writing as a blue collar thing. Like I try really hard. The people who I, I look up to the most tend not to treat writing as precious. I also believe as an artist in the, the more stuff theory, I believe that the more work you produce, the better work you will produce. As long as you have some level of self analysis and critique and also analysis and critique from outside, but by and large, I don't really believe in like endless revisions of work, you know, one or two drafts, and then maybe finally a third one if an editor wants you to. But if it's not good enough after that, you just do something different instead uh, and learn from the failures. I try to learn from failure as fast as possible. And so from that point of view, I also tend to believe that I should just sit down and write if what I'm doing is writing. If I got a book to finish, I got a book to finish. You know, I like the longest... Well, now the longest book I've written is a currently unpublished YA book that I think will be coming out next year, but I'm not entirely certain. I have a few other books that I'm trying to get out before then. But for the longest time, the longest book I had written was just one of these trashy heterosexual romance novels. And I had to write it in three weeks because they gave me a month, but the whole thing felt so scammy that I waited for the check to clear. And then I only had three weeks left. And so then I sat there and wrote for like, I don't know, eight to 10 hours a day without breaks or without days off and listen to stone or metal to obliterate my brain, actually the same album over and over again for like a week. And I just like lost my brain and wrote a trashy romance novel and got paid and used it to get a new computer. Cause mine was broken. And, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not trying to knock someone who's going to like light candles and sit at their favorite desk and like wait for the moon to come out. But like, to me, that's like what you do for like a bath, you know, or like, that's what you even do for like dinner. You know, that's what you do for different experiences than writing. Writing is work. Um, I don't go out to the wood shop and be like, before I can work on this instrument, I must like, I don't know, um, create the atmosphere. Um, Although yeah, maybe when I'm finishing it up, you know, like maybe it needs to be bathed in the full moon or whatever, like for the final part of making the instrument. That's cool. Um, I guess now that we don't print out manuscripts on, you know, 8,000 dead trees, mm-hmm. it's hard to set those out under the moon. I don't feel comfortable setting my laptop out on the balcony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder how I would even. Okay. It, it, to, to walk back. I really like walking back my own statements. <laughs> Oh, it's really fun. I I kind of think I got into writing partly as an aesthetic decision. Like, and I think aesthetic and, and magic is not, they're not antonyms, you know, they're related concepts. And, you know, I, the first time I was like, I'm really going to be a writer. I was like living in an abandoned tenement building in the South Bronx. I was like 20 and you know, I had a room on the fifth floor. There's no electricity up there. Actually, there might have been, but I don't think I had a lamp. I don't remember the electrical situation of that building. And I had there was like this old beat up roll top desk that was just already in this room, even though there was like a broken window and like a mattress on the floor. And I drank too much cheap beer back then and stuff. And I didn't have a computer. And I just like sat down and hand wrote these like really terrible stories, you know, and And so it was less the like ritual of this ritual is going to infuse my work. And it was more of the like, I'm going to invoke me. I'm going to bring me out. I'm going to create the the person I want to be. And the person I want to be is a pretentious artist, you know, who's like, likes pretty things. And is like, really prefers to find pretty things in desolate places. And rather than through like, wealth or whatever, you know. And do you still think of yourself as a pretentious artist? People like to call me a pretentious artist, but then I looked up the word pretentious and I determined I am technically not pretentious because in order to be pretentious, you have to be kind of faking it. Um, and, and I think that there's like a certain amount of, um, I don't know. It's, it's not my favorite thing about myself that like a lot of people are like, there's Margaret. She's always like lost in her own world of, whatever thing. And and there's a certain amount of self-importance involved in being a creative. And I think it's complicated because I think on some level that's necessary because you need to be able to say either, I think I'm so great that people should read me, or I don't care what other people think. 
I want to make this thing. You know, you need to be in one of those two positions. You can't be a, I really care what people think and I'm worried I'm not good enough. That's a really bad way to succeed as a writer. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and that kind of sucks because uh, that, that cuts out a lot of people who probably have really more important stories to tell. But, but I also think a lot of the best creators kind of live in their own fantasy worlds and they kind of create their own, you know, complicated narratives that interact with each other. Even if they, even if it doesn't tie directly into the book or the album or the movie or whatever it is they're making, you know, I, I think most of the best creatives develop their own artistic language over the course of their lives and continue to work with that. And that is a self-indulgent thing to do. Um, you could probably pull it off to be collectively indulgent and create like a, a writer circle that does the exact same thing. Uh, and that's cool too. But, but it also gets really messy because that same drive towards living in your own fantasy world and then showing it to people creates really bad people sometimes, you know, it, um, it lends itself to thinking like there's a difference between like, I think my work is important and I think that your work is important. And I think that his work is important. And I think that their work is important. You know Um, I'm personally currently advocating for my own, but tomorrow I'll be advocating for hers, you know, rather than like, I'm so important and other people aren't is, is where I think it starts to go bad or other Mm. people should live in service of my ideas which is also complicated because that's what you do as an artist beyond self-publishing is, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I think about the labor that goes into editing and publishing my stuff. And it feels like awful that I'm the only one with the name on the cover sometimes, you know? Um, uh, Yeah. I don't know. It's a messy balance and I guess I'm trying to do the best I can, but. I I do think that that idea that, that you have to walk this line between having imposter syndrome to not be a bad person. And then to also mm-hmm. like believe in yourself enough to actually put it out there in the world and let people think what they're going to think. It's a, it's a weird, it's a weird space to be in. And I yeah. still have moments where people are like, Oh my God, I can't believe you published a book. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, it was work, you know, but they're like yeah. met a magical unicorn. And I was like, I've had that reaction to other writers. I admire, like I've met a magical unicorn, even though I know it's work, you know, it's, yeah. it's a very strange place. I agree. Yeah, totally. And then there's people who will also like basically work their jealousy out by bringing you down, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to say like a lot of people don't like me because they don't like me because I'm not not a perfect person and my work isn't perfect, you know, but I think sometimes people will just be like, Oh, well you published a book because you got handed a book instead of, Oh, you published a book because you worked your ass off. Like you, you wrote it, you, you did it. It, It's an incredible amount of work. You know, it's the hardest brain thing I've ever tried to do in my life is write a novel, you know, Mm -hmm. keeping track of that many characters, narratives, themes, whatever, like there's a reason I write short books, (laughs) you know, it's hard. Yeah. I, I, I too am a writer of shorter books because like, well, I started out writing poetry for one. Mm Mm-hmm. So cool. you, you learn brevity first, right. You know, and then, yeah. but yeah, I can't keep track of like war and peace when I read it. So I know I can't keep yeah. track of it if I'm trying to write it. Yeah. I really want to read war and peace, but I'm so, I'm too intimidated, but I only I, want to read it because now I like, go ahead. Oh no. I was just like, having gotten through that and then oh, mm-hmm. crime and punishment in college, mm-hmm. I, I felt like I was being punished. <laughs> They're, they're fantastic books and they're, you know, yeah, yeah. I think in some level they're important to read, but also at the same time, I was like, why is it this long? Like, why is there so much of it? Well, okay. I mean, it kind of gets into that self-importance because no one told them they couldn't, right? Like one of the things I, I remember hearing, um, I think this is at Clarion, everything I learned is at Clarion. That's actually not true, but you know, when you, when you write your first novel as an artist, as an author, you probably can include eight pages about how stained glass like casts light on the floor of the chapel, you know, and you probably can't get away with like writing in all the scientific details about the, the light as it comes through and, and the different 
I don't know, whatever. Because people, the, an editor will look at it and be like, no one wants to read this and they'll cut it out. <laughs> and by and large, you're honestly going to end up with a better book that way. But once you have an audience, <laughs> then you can put in your eight pages about that and no one will stop you because you're a name, right? And I don't know if that's better or worse. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I will not name the author, but they're a very prolific author over many decades. And in my writing discussion group, um, one of the women was like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to read through like chapter seven in this book. And their their grocery list is going to be in it because no one is editing these books at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and totally. I was like, mm-hmm, yeah. So <laughs> I think I think you have a point. And like, <laughs> yeah. And on some level, they like deserve that because like, I don't know. Um, I really don't mean this to, uh, this is a author that I absolutely look up to and I consider a better writer than me, but Kim Stanley Robinson writes huge books full of technical details. Um, uh, the Ministry of the Future is a different sort of, that's my current favorite Kim Stanley Robinson book. It's the most recent one I read. And I think it's his most recent book, but I'm not sure. But some of his older books are just like, here, let me tell you about the landscape of Mars. And and it's just going to be page after page about exactly how the different geological formations came to be. And it's really cool and it's really dry and it's just a different, mm-hmm. you just go at it differently. You know, like most days I don't want to read Ken Stanley Robinson, even though he's absolutely one of my favorite authors and one of, I think one of the most important living authors, you know, most days that's not <laughs> the speed I'm going for. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I am in the mood, I don't mind if he could throw a grocery list in there and I'd be like, huh, I wonder what the oranges yeah. are for. Yeah. yeah. I mean, The Years of Rice and Saul is one of my favorite novels of all time. But he yeah. is very, he waxes poetic in that one a lot more mm-hmm. often than in some of his other stuff, too. Uh, I think That's the first true. book I read of his was The Three Californias. I read okay. that, that series first, which I think is also less dry than the Mars series. And that, I think that was his first yeah. series. Mars is yeah. probably the driest, I think, of them. Antarctica being in competition, but it's really <laughs> kind of the same thing. It's just all about <laughs> geology. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but, you know, he... I actually, I read The Years of Rice and Salt while I had a really bad fever and couldn't get out of bed. Oh, and that wow. was the perfect way to read it, except I don't remember a word of it. <laughs> but I really liked it. <laughs> um, it's, it's very, it, it has a special place in my heart. My, um, my current, my partner, my husband, and I've read it. Mm-hmm. I read it and then I gave it to him and we were dating to read mm-hmm. and we both just got obsessed with it. So that's cool. Yeah. So it's like our book yeah. in a weird way. I, I didn't know people could have an <laughs> our book, but apparently we have an our book. So, yeah, I think I've had an our book with people. I definitely had like our author, although no, that's not true because it's usually just Ursula Gwynn with whoever I'm dating. <laughs> so I guess it's not really it's special. It's like a collective, author. a collective thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but you met her. So you have a, like a little leg up there. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. But then it, I don't know. It's just always funny to be like, oh, I live in a writer. Like when you realize that authors are just people and you can like meet them. But then it's like, if you assume, I don't know, whatever, it's weird. Cause you don't want to just like go across Kim Stanley Robinson on the street and be like, Hey, you're just a person. Talk to me. Cause that's just, <laughs> that'd be rude. <laughs> no one wants to talk to a random person on the street. Right. Yeah. But like, but like when you actually meet people through like a professional environment or whatever, you're like, Oh yeah, you're, you're a person. You're just, you know, I mean, it's a nice guy. Or, low key why I started the podcast. So, <laughs> I mean, I just told you I got my start by interviewing authors. So, <laughs> you know, it's a good plan. Um, good plan. So you talked about Clarion, which I'm fascinated. I did. I hadn't heard mm-hmm. of it before. You, I actually we talked mm-hmm. earlier, but I had listened to a talk you gave at the Durham Library a couple weeks ago, I guess, and you talked about it mm-hmm. there. But I hadn't heard of it before that. But I mean, that sounds like a formative experience, honestly. But in that, like, do you feel like there was something you took away, like, kind of like? if you were going to give someone like a crystallization of what that work looked like, like what you took away from that. I think that writing is a craft as well as an art and the craft 
absolutely can be learned in the same way that you learn how to build a house. And people will knock formulas all day long and then live in a timber framed house or a stud framed two by four framed house. And every house is very different from every, well, ideally every house is very different from other. <laughs> Clearly we've all seen the examples of McMansions or cookie cutter novels that are the same as every other novel. Mm -hmm. But by and large, if you build a house, it's not going to come out like other people's houses and it's going to be unique and it's going to have its own value. And then sometimes, even if it is exactly the same as the house next door, the family that lives in it, it's their house and it means the most to them. So, you know, there's this quote that I don't remember who's by, which is actually great for what the quote is, which is that masterpieces are great for the dead, but they're not great for the living. Uh, because we want to create these things. We want to create our own culture. And so, even if you write a cookie cutter book, the person who reads it, it might not be cookie cutter to them. I think about this all the time when I watch like, like a YA series or like a, like if I'm watching TV and it's like a YA TV, I'm like, Ugh, I've seen these tropes a million times. And I'm like, well, I'm 39 fucking years old. <laughs> you know, someone's watching this the, for the first time. And maybe when I watched uh, ET, I don't know, that was, actually, I'm trying to think about the one with the robot. There's like a robot movie when I was a kid, Short Circuit. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved this movie as a kid. I don't remember anything about it. It might have been tropes that adults were rolling their eyes at, but to, I, I didn't care. I was a kid, you know, and we get to discover things and do things on our own. And so it doesn't matter if it's done, been done before to a large degree. Like, mm -hmm. and I actually think magic actually ties in really well with that because it's like, it's almost like I invented something. I was like, well, that guy already invented it. And I'm like, yeah, but so did I, you know? <laughs> Um, and you don't get like the social points, right? You can't leverage that for power in society. If I write the same book as someone else, I shouldn't get like social points for that, but it still might be meaningful to me. Um, I'm not saying go out and like literally copy point by point someone else's book, but, um, but this is kind of tangential, but what I, I feel like what I learned at Clarion was like how to build a, a, a stud framed house or maybe even like why it's okay to build a stud framed house because you learn that you're still building it to your own blueprint and you're still filling it with the, the furniture and the decoration that you want. And it's still being occupied by a, a new family. Mm -hmm. I like that analogy of the house in the book a lot. And I, and I do think, I don't know, I, I think this is Neil Gaiman, but I never say it exactly the way he said it, mm -hmm. but just that, you know, you are the only person who can tell the story you're going to tell, like, because mm -hmm. it's, like you've picked up all these pieces from what you've read and done and, you know, your life that you've lived. So it's yeah. always going to be a little different, even if it is telling a similar story. Yeah, totally. And honestly, like, I don't actually really listen to much punk music. Um, I listen to pop and goth and metal and a bunch of other stuff. I sometimes listen to punk, but the thing I love about punk and why punk as a subculture uh, it was so important to me when I was younger is that it's, it's, it tells you this, it tells you like, it doesn't matter if your band's good, just go out and be in a band. And then bands that are really good, we're going to kind of hold them up higher because they're better and they mm -hmm. rule and we want to go see them and we want to have the aesthetic experiences that they're offering to us by the spells they cast. But there's also a really good spell at that basement show down the street with like, some 15 year olds who don't know how to play their instruments, you know, but it's loud and it has a, an energy to it that we all need right now or something. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and I don't think that punk is anywhere near the only uh, sub musical subculture that does this. It's the one that was available to me uh, in my own experiences, mm -hmm. basically as a white girl. And yeah. And, and I, I think that that we need that with books too. We need to not be afraid. Like, like, don't not write a book because you're not as good as Kim Stanley Robinson. Like, no one's as good at being Kim Stanley Robinson as Kim Stanley Robinson is, you know? Um, so just do your thing. And then, I don't know, maybe people will hold it up really high. And then maybe people, some people will like it. And hey, if mm -hmm. you learn how to enjoy it while you write it too, you know? Yeah. Do you think about what success looks like for you as a writer? I mean, do you have an idea of what success is for you? Yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's a scale. I actually think I'm at success uh, by and large in that um, 
Well, I actually recently took a nonprofit job, uh, literally because I care about the company or the the nonprofit and like what what they do. It, it helps support workers' cooperatives and helps employees buy out their businesses from their owners and uh, and spreads values that I care about. And it's actually the I just shout it out. It's called Seed Commons, and it's the best thing going that I've ever seen in terms of the contemporary United States outside of like mass revolt in order to get rid of capitalism. And but other than that, I, I was surviving as a creative professional and surviving as a creative professional feels like success. Um, I was surviving because I, I don't have any children or like ailments that, you know, require me to spend a lot of money to fix them. And, you know, my, my unique circumstances allowed me to set my bar of success much lower, but it still feels like success. And then there's also bars about like their success, like finishing a book is success, finishing a book and having someone read it and like it, having someone you don't know, like your stuff is success. Um, and there's, you know, I'm, I'm ambitious. Um, I don't believe in hierarchy and I don't want to be like at the top of thing, but I like, I don't know. I don't mind the idea of like more people reading my stuff and like, you know, I could see like, there's like stuff I hope happens, you know, I, um, I don't know. I actually don't think it would work as magic to invoke it by saying it in this particular context, but like <laughs> there's stuff that I'm like, there's like milestones I'd like to meet, you know, but I honestly like finishing a country of ghosts and putting it out there was one of the most important milestones for me because it was just like, I've said a thing that took my entire higher twenties and a chunk of my thirties to learn how to say both in terms of the, the craft of writing to be able to say it well, but also the experience as an activist and an anarchist to know what to say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I used to have a lot of anxiety problems. And so I would often think that I was dying uh, when it turns out I, I wasn't apparently. Um, and one of the times I thought I was dying, I, you know, I, I was sick and like, I had just finished a country of ghosts and it was about to be published. And I was like, you know what? Like, all right, if I die, I, I, I got that book out, you know, and I no longer see that as like a high watermark of my career or whatever. Right. But I don't know. I think it's like useful to kind of always be setting those things and like always have you it's like writing the stuff onto your to-do list after you do it so you can cross it off, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's like, I don't know, just always more, you know, like I, I want more, <laughs> uh, but I, I want it for everyone too, you know, or like yeah. some. Yeah. I, it's funny. I, I've talked about this with somebody else on the podcast, but cause they asked like why the podcast and I was like, well, low key, so I can talk to other authors, but also mm -hmm. like, what is success for this podcast? Cause you know, everybody has mm -hmm. a podcast. I, it's like yeah. having a zine in the nineties. It's the same thing. Yeah. And yeah, you know, rules. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like, I, you know, I don't expect to make like top 10 lists on Apple podcasts or anything. I said, I would just love mm -hmm. like at some point down the road, if somebody came out to me and goes, you know, I uh, finished my book and sent it off because I listened to writers talk on your podcast. Yeah. Like that would be massively cool. Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell you my moment like that with one of my podcasts? Mm -hmm. Um, sorry. Now I feel like I'm like, no, 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 please being interviewed. But, um, so one of my podcasts is called live like the world is dying and it's a individual and community preparedness podcast. It's basically like preppers, but leftist and like community focused instead of hole up in your basement with gun and beans and rice or whatever. Um, or I guess for most people aren't vegan. So that's how I um, discovered first. That was the first, whatever. that was my first contact oh, cool. with your work. I see the podcast. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And and I got this email and it was, it was after the, you know, it's hard to keep track of all the horrible disasters that keep happening everywhere right now, which is funny because people are like, why are you a prepper? And I'm like, have you, do you know what the news is? Have you looked at the news? Um, have you, have you talked to a scientist lately? Anyway, this, this mom wrote me and I mean, I'm sure she has other characteristics as mom, but it relates to the story. And she was like, my son was living in a basement apartment in, in Texas and I sent him an emergency kit based on hearing your podcast. And he told me it was like the fact that I had sent him a flashlight was the only reason he had light for like several days. 
And I was just like, oh, okay. All of the work I've done into this podcast, because podcasting often feels like screaming into the void. You're like, you don't, I don't know if anyone's listening or whatever is, is a very common response. Right. You know? Um, but yeah, like someone sent their kid a flashlight and it, save their sanity at the very least, you know? Yeah. So that's cool. I, I, I have faith that someone will be listening to this and will finish their book. And if you are listening to this, you should finish your book and send it off because that is a very important part of writing is finishing and things and sending it off. Email Margaret and I and tell us that you did it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. And if nothing else, just think of it as like fail faster. If you're a new writer, and, and now I'm just pretending like I'm talking to new writers, but your job as a new writer is to fail faster. I like so, it. I like it. And you don't know if you have failed until you've sent it off. So do it and then send it off. Yes. Um, so we have a game of chance at the end of the podcast, which I know I say in questions and you maybe not get a chance to look at them. But if, before we get to that, I wanted to give you an opportunity mm-hmm. to talk about your upcoming book and anything else you want to share with folks or let them know where to reach you. Oh, okay. Um, for anyone who's listening, I was sent questions and then I read them and then I forgot about them because I flaked and I'm terribly embarrassed. And now everyone can share in my shame. Yeah, it's because uh, you have 27 and I don't have a good tabs memory. open. That's I know. <laughs> my brain is out of memory. Ah, memory out of RAM. Okay. Like literally, what did you just add? Oh, I'm going to tell you about my books. Um, the, the newest thing I have going on is that I have a, a, a podcast called Cool People Who Did Cool Stuff, which is basically history storytelling, but with actual, I write down notes and have like dates and names and stuff, but it's mostly trying to tell stories about revolt and rebellion and kind of remind people that like we actually can fight against all of the bad stuff that's happening because people have been fighting often successfully and then often learning to define success on their own terms. Um, which means sometimes they die at the end, but you know, I mean, who hasn't watched a movie where someone does really, really cool stuff and then dies at the end and still not been used like, well, that guy's cool. You know, I wouldn't hate to be that person because we all die at the end. Spoiler. Uh, no one's getting out of this alive. <laughs> it's worth fighting back against things. Um, unless until we figure out the whole lich thing, but, uh, okay. So I have that new podcast that's available anywhere you listen to your podcasts. New episodes come out every Monday and Wednesday. You can find it Full Zone Media. Uh, I spend a lot of my time pitching this. And <laughs> the other thing that I have uh, is coming out September 20th, I think, is my next book. It's a collection of short stories called We Won't Be Here Tomorrow. And it comes out from AK Press, which is that worker-owned uh, anarchist book publisher that I was talking about. I'm very excited to be working with them again. I'm very excited. They've been expanding their their fiction line uh, substantially over the past couple of years. And yeah, it's just, it's my short stories. If you like uh, lesbian, I almost said werewolves, but it's not what I meant to say, although I should write that too. Um, lesbian mermaid and the, who a thief feeds men to or squatter hackers or like different, weird activists and people people who dress up like orcs and go live in the woods um and fight other people who dress up like orcs who are nazis uh vikings coming back who are in valhalla coming to fight on the anti-fascist side of a civil war because nazis don't go to valhalla um i don't know a trans girl arsonist who falls in love with a ghost um shit like that i write shit like that and you can read shit like that uh and it is not available for pre-order yet although it might be by the time this comes out i think it'll be up for pre-order sometime in the middle of june um it's called we won't be here tomorrow oh and i'm started yet another worker run i didn't personally start well i started originally but there's a worker run cooperative publisher that I'm now part of that actually is looking for fiction submissions. We pay slightly less than professional rates. We pay $200 per story, uh, which is not, I guess if you wrote a really short story, it'd be professional rates, but don't do that to us. Um, And it's called Strangers in the Tangled Wilderness. And we put out a new zine every month that 
if you support us on Patreon, we'll mail it to you anywhere in the world. And we also put all of our stuff up for free. And we're not just looking for fiction. We're looking for memoir and uh, would love to do stuff about like radical witch stuff. If anyone listening to this um, wants to get in on that tangledwilderness.org has all of our, uh, our writer's guidelines. And that's a, a, a small scrappy worker run cooperative that I'm uh, now working on with people. And I'm sure there's other projects. I'm in a bunch of bands. <laughs> um, the witchiest of these bands is called Feminaz Ghoul. Uh, we very consciously use our songs as um, as ritual. So, what about you? Wait, you have to tell the audience about what, what I'm doing. Going on. Uh, yeah. So I'm currently writing a story for an anthology that comes out in December that is basically on the trend of monster fuckers. And so <laughs> we're all writing a cryptid shifter story for it. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, <laughs> so that's what I'm currently working on. And I'm also working on a novel um, that I hope to be the first in a new series that is a, a woman who can channel dead artists. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. Do they want to be? And I, I won't ask you this. They want to be, but she doesn't right? want to be. <laughs> oh, cool. Cool. Oh, yeah. No, that goes very well with the whole artist are kind of self-important thing. <laughs> right. Like, no, no, we got to do even more. It doesn't matter that we're dead. Yes. <laughs> Make exactly. us more famous. Yeah. When you said yeah, that totally. earlier, I laughed because I was like, oh, God, that's the book theme. Um, <laughs> 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 cool. So that's what's going on right now. And I started this podcast, which, you know, this will be toward the end of season two. So cool. Which is cool. So, yeah. Um, so our last, our game of chance for everybody is mm -hmm. I roll a die. And mm -hmm. um, if you, depending on what number you get, I will ask you uh, questions we're not supposed to talk about in polite company question. Ooh. So it's okay. death, sex, religion, politics, or money. And okay. then if I roll a six, you get to pick which one you want. So, okay. Yeah. So this is our, this is our tiny hook for the podcast. So. Okay. Four politics which i feel is kind of what we've talked about the whole time it is weird because i'm like this is what the po the podcast is actually about and then we have this extra yeah. singer on the end um <laughs> so this politics i knew was going to be a hard question mm -hmm. for you because i knew that we would talk about that <laughs> <laughs> throughout the thing so this one is kind of more about like reading and writing so what okay. three books on anarchism or witchcraft would you recommend to a newly minted anarchist witch? Ooh, okay. Um, oh man, I need like Jeopardy music playing as, <laughs> as I think about this. There is, I'm like, part of me is like, oh, just go read a country ghost. But that's cheating. I mean, I would recommend that. Uh, um, but I, I can I'm recommend it on your behalf. List. I will recommend it okay. on your behalf. Okay, but I'm still not going to use it. Um, <laughs> I would tell, even though it's a little bit of a complicated pick, The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin is another anarchist society that is described in fiction, and it is described by a um, a master of science fiction. And it is so anarchistic that it is intensely critical of the anarchist society within it. Um, so it it might not be a good, like, this is my first thinking about anarchism, but it's it's a very good, like, I have done a little bit of thinking about it. Uh, I would say go read The Dispossessed. Um, and there's a book I haven't finished yet that is the most influential book upon a lot of my thinking and the thinking of a lot of people around me. And so I would recommend people go read this book. But I will. my caveat is I'm really bad at reading theory. It's part of the reason I write fiction. I get most of my theory through conversation. I get most of my theory from other people read books and then explain them to me. Um, I can read history and that's actually new, but I used to only be able to read fiction. <laughs> um, there's a book called Caliban and the witch uh, by Sylvia Federici, who uh, isn't an anarchist is an autonomous Marxist, which is not the furthest thing from anarchist. And there's some complications about more modern Sylvia Federici stuff that I really don't want to get into. Uh, but it's a book about how, primitive accumulation worked against women in history. Um, and so could primitive accumulation being this idea of 
how capitalism got its capital in the first place, because capitalism is not the use of money. Capitalism is the use of money to make money rather than labor. Like if you, if you work for your money, then you're not doing capitalism. If other people do your, do work for your money, you're doing capitalism. If you own stuff and then leverage it to make money, you're doing capitalism. But where did capitalism get that stuff in the first place? And the answer is colonization by and large. Uh, it was the, um, destruction of the globe and destruction of its peoples by going around and stealing all their shit. Um, and this is, gets called primitive accumu accumulation, which I kind of hate all the jargon, which is actually why I struggle with reading theory is that I hate jargon. Um, and this, this book makes the argument as far as I understand, as it has been explained to me, because I have not finished it because I struggle with it. Um, but maybe you don't dear listener. It makes the argument that people, um, uh, patriarchy in particular goes and has a, essentially done this primitive accumulation upon uh, from the work of women throughout history. Uh, so that would be the second book I would recommend. And I wish I had just a, like a, here's the, like, I know people have written the, like, here's the anarchy, witch books. And I, I just haven't read them yet. These are your recommendations, so it doesn't have to be that book. So yeah, okay. it can be fiction. Um, it can be whatever it is. The uh, oh, I always struggle. I whenever I whenever I'm asked for recommendations, probably every guest does this, but whenever I'm asked for recommendations, I just basically my brain goes blank, and I've never read a book in my life. <laughs> um, so I would say, as another book, go read. <laughs> go read the anarchist expropriators um which is by i think osvaldo bayer it's a really short anarchist history book about a bunch of bank robbers it does not tell you that much about the history of anarchism uh, because the history of anarchism is not mostly anarchists in south america robbing people but this book is <laughs> um and it's not, I literally, I think I'm picking it because it's one of the last books I read for my history podcast and all the other books have been That's evaporated totally out of my brain. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. No, that's, that's totally fair. That's totally fair. Oh, <laughs> okay. no, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. I just so appreciate it. Of and, course. Um, thanks for letting me fangirl a little bit and all those well, good things. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I, um, I'll be, I'll be curious if, if we get someone to send their book. Yeah. I know that Send would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So if, you, if they email you first, you have to let me know. <laughs> okay. I will. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much, Margaret. Yep. Have a good night. Bye. Witch Lit is a production of Thousand Volt Press and is edited by Kaifel Agostini, who also designed our logo. Our music is Voices, composed for us by Alexander Shnekar. You can support our work, get early access to episodes, ask your own death, sex, religion, politics, money questions, and get some free stuff by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash witchlitpod. Transcripts and all our previous episodes are available at witchlitpod.com, and you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at witchlitpod. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and consider giving us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps other witches find the show. Thanks for listening and for reading Witchy.